Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea. Beyond this sacred page I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. But we pray for ourselves. We pray for the class checked in here in Tarpon Springs, Florida, those that watch by television, including those watching in Ireland on that big screen. Lord, bless them. Especially, I pray of you. Holy Spirit, how much we depend on you. And as the porter who opens the door for the shepherd to come to the sheep, do it in this message. Let, let us be in church this morning eager for God's word as if it's food to a starving man. As if we'd never heard it before. Shepherd, have your way with the sheep, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I do greet you all who join us by television, and I especially say hi to you there, meeting and watching this around your TV set or a big screen, I'm not sure how you do it, in Belfast. Uh, you, Albert and uh, Isaac and others with you there, and my sisters and the rest of you, God bless you all. I know you are watching this very day, and you do watch, of course, all the time, too. God bless you. We're all getting settled in. We have got the notes in front of us, and we will read the first little part. Moses was used by God to teach the people many things, and here is a summary. The law, the tabernacle, the sacrificial offerings, the priesthood. Look this way. And as the song says, start at the very beginning. The children of Israel are in Egypt. God delivers them. They're now in the wilderness, and they're going to go to Canaan's land. In many ways, it typifies our journey as Christians. We learn lessons back in the Old Testament, which is further amplified in the New Testament, and then applied to our lives. We have come out of this world in the sense that we're saved, but we're now in a journey, and we're going to Canaan's land, which can either be, in a sense, the life of victory down here, or some typify it as heaven up there. Sometimes it applies to one and not the other, sometimes to both. So when God brings them out from Egypt, He tells Moses, the leader, come up to Mount Sinai. I need to talk to you. And He talked to him for a long time, because they had nothing. They had no printed material. They had nothing to teach them about Him, about things to do with Him, all of which would help us one day when the fulfillment of these types and shadows would come about, which would all be in Christ. So one of the first things He taught them, according to your notes, He taught them the law, including the Decalogue. The Decalogue is a big fancy name for the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. It's all done for our good. Like you saying to a child, don't run across in front of the bus. You're not trying to be a spoiled sport. You're only trying to preserve him. God tells us what to do or not to do. It's for our own good. He gave a whole lot of laws and ceremonial laws. Moses got them all written down. It was just um, tremendous, the list of laws, as I say, including what we call the Ten Commandments. However, the law not only shows God's standard. It shows that we as human beings cannot always keep God's standard. We can't do it because we're human and we fail, and we need somebody else's righteousness to take as a gift in order to satisfy the demands of God. And that's where salvation comes into us, typified by what God told him next when he was up on the same mountain. He gave him the whole idea of the tabernacle in the wilderness, which thing we are recreating over here by God's grace. We're building one to scale, and it will teach about salvation, about Christ, and about us in Christ. You know about that. We've been over it many times. Then he tells about the sacrificial offerings. And one time we took, I think it was four weeks to talk, five weeks to talk about the five Levitical offerings, and there's different kinds of sacrificial offerings. It all typifies the ministry. So then he tells them about the priesthood. You see it there, number four, the priesthood. What's meant by the priesthood? Now, you may think, well, all of this is a little heavy or deep for me. It's not. We take it slow and just listen. 
The priesthood. The priest is a pontifex in the Latin. That he is a go-between, between us and God. And God said, you're going to need somebody between you to assist Moses. He really was a prophet, priest, king, everything. But you're going to need somebody to help you. So God said, your brother will fill that. He will be the high priest. And his four sons will be the what we would call the ordinary priests. And they will be there for two main things, the sacrificial offerings and the service within the tabernacle. And they will be the go-between between God and the regular ordinary people. That is the priesthood. And of course, the priesthood then is typified either in us, we're kings and priests unto God, or of course in our Lord Jesus Christ, Him being the great high priest, the go-between between us and our heavenly Father. So God said, I'm going to tell you about the details of the priesthood. Remember again, it would be Aaron and it would be his four sons. And God said, I'm going to give you special clothing. It had to be made, of course, but I'll give you the details. And the clothing will all typify beautiful things that I want to teach you. And when it comes down to us, they're spiritual lessons that apply to us and they're beautiful. On the back of these notes, there is a sketch there, and we'll get to it eventually, telling about the high priest's garments. For glory and for beauty, all speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a simple message. It's almost like, you know, somebody going to buy a, a, a new motorbike or buy a new car. But before you get it, you get the brochure. You've got the brochure. There it is. Tells you all about the engine. Tells you all about the miles per gallon. Tells you all about the tires. You don't have it yet. But my, you've got a good idea of what it's going to look like. Then when you get the real thing, why that's even better again, obviously. But it was good to get that first thing because it gives you a lot of details. Almost like the, 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 the book of the, of the car that you keep in the glove compartment. When you really need to get into the car in depth, you take it, that book, you look at it all in depth. So in the New Testament and the Old Testament, we have Christ in depth. We can enjoy Him as a person, but then we get Him in depth. So I'm going to tell you about the priesthood. And it says here, the priesthood consisted of, are you looking at your notes there? One, Aaron. Two would be his four boys. And three would be the whole of his tribe. The Levites. Let's read the next bit. It is important to keep these three areas clearly in mind. That is Aaron, the high priest, his sons, the four, what we would call ordinary or regular priests, and then the whole tribe of the Levites, look this way, who did priestly work, not like these other five, Aaron and his four sons, but you know, they helped to transport the tabernacle when it was moving. They all had their various things to do. And this speaks to us, these three compartments here speak to us of Christ. He's the great high priest. And then there is the ministry that you come to enjoy of Domitas and others. And then there is the fact that we're all in the kingdom of God as priests and kings unto God. And while we may not speak or sing or play up here, we all have a part to play within the kingdom. So you can see that these three areas apply to us. Aaron and his sons and his tribe. That's Jesus and the ministry and then the people in the ministry. That's you and we all have a job to do. Clear so far? Amen. Then it says, it is important to keep these three areas clearly in mind. One, when Aaron is considered alone, he is the picture or the representative of the priestly ministry of our great high priest, the go-between, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you may say, I'm just throwing this in, though it's not in the notes here, look this way. And one of the things that threw people when off gear when Paul arrived and started to say that Jesus was the fulfillment of the great high priest. And those Jewish people said he couldn't be because the priests are of the tribe of Levi. You can't be a priest unless you're one of the Levites. Where did Jesus come out of? He came out of Judah. Well, he can't be the priest then. Forget it. That was a real battle for Paul, and he had to teach the people that the Bible said if you're from the tribe of Levi, you have to have different priests because they keep dying. But I'm going to send one of the tribe of Judah. He will be different to signify this one will never die, but he will be a high priest forever after the power of an endless life. That's why he came out of Judah and not out of the Levites. 
Aaron and uh, no, when Aaron is considered alone, he represents the priestly ministry of Jesus. Look at me. Just nod this time. You, you've got that, haven't you? That's the priestly ministry of Jesus. We get that from Aaron. We learn a lot. Number two, Aaron and his sons typ typify the ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, domitas, people that minister to you and bless you. There are some who are false prophets and all that. We know that, but there are very many genuine ones too, typified uh, partly by Aaron, mostly by his sons there. And then you go further than that. What about the whole tribe of Levites that typifies the body of Christ? That's where you come in. Aaron and his tribe, that is the Levites, represent the individual believer rather than the corporate body, which also includes the domitas and the fivefold ministry. Have you got that? The priests had special beautiful clothing for glory and for beauty. Exodus 28 verse 2 says, And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and beauty. Look this way. It would be beautiful. Now, when you see somebody with, especially you ladies, you've got a new dress or something on, uh, it's easy to say, hey, I love that. That's beautiful. It strikes you. It's something nice. Well, these men, what they wore was strikingly beautiful. But it wasn't just for them, because everything they were wearing and the colors and the various things that made up, stones and so forth, made up their dress was a typification of the Lord Jesus Christ because He's so immense. We not only need to get to know Him in His various names, but in the various areas of His very dress or the dress of the priests, which speak of the various perspectives of Christ. So He is what? Well, there it is again. He is the one that's glorious and full of beauty. He is the lily of the valley and the bright and the morning star and the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. He is indeed the epitome of what? Of glory and beauty. But the priests actually had those garments. We don't have to have those garments and we cannot see Jesus' garments, but we know from the scriptures and for our experience with Him he is glorious and He is beautiful. I don't want to spend too much time at the moment, but quickly just flip to the back page, if you would, for a moment. Don't you think that must have been beautiful to see that? Those are 12 stones that you see there on His breastplate. And there was a big stone in His shoulder and a big stone on the other shoulder called the onyx stone, set in arches of gold. I mean, absolutely beautiful from the inner coat, which was the white one and then the blue one and then the ephod. And well, we'll talk about it later. But just a quick look to show you, don't you think that must have looked impressive right there in the wilderness, you know? And the other uh, boys had wonderful uh, clothes too, not quite so fancy as Papa, as Aaron himself. And then it says here next, now we're, we're, we're leading up to something very serious here. So you can go back to the first sheet. First page, Aaron's four sons were called Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. The priests dealt mainly with sacrifices and service unto God, ministering to Him within the tabernacle. But, I wish I didn't have to say this part, but on the very first day of their ordination, Look this way. Look this way. Imagine somebody being called to the ministry. And then you build up. Here they built up for at least eight days. Sometimes you could be building up for eight months. A couple of years you bring in your family, bring in your friends. You're holding a special service. Many of the big denomina denominations have these. And you have an ordination service. I'm sure you've been to a service where a new pastor... Maybe a young man came out of Bible school and he was ordained to the ministry. There's something beautiful about it when the older men lay hands upon him and commit him and his ministry to the Lord. Beautiful. Well, these five who had been chosen, Aaron and the four boys, and I named them Abihu, and uh, what were their names? Nadab, Eliezer, and Ithamar. It's only the first two I want to really refer to. They're all ready, ready to go. They're all excited. They're all thrilled. The family's there. Everybody's there. The camp's outside. They're getting ready for this great uh, ordination. First day of operation. And they start. Now look at me while I tell you the truth. 
They hadn't started right until, zap, the power of God came out of the holiest of all in the form of fire and killed two of them and left their bodies charred on the ground. The two eldest boys dead on the spot at the beginning of the first of the ordination service. They had been getting ready for a while, but this was the first service of operation. What in the world is going on? A few weeks ago, I mentioned to you about the law of the first mention. And when a thing is happening for the first time in the Bible, God is saying, I want you to get this, whether it's in blessing or in judgment. So God is saying, regarding the ministry, I want you to get this and find out what these two did wrong. I give you the setting again. There's millions of people out there uh, in the Israelites camped all around on four sides of the tabernacle. Moses is there. It's a very wonderful day. It's an exciting day. And, and the, the, this garb that they have got is absolutely terrific. Imagine getting mowed down in the tabernacle where you're supposed to be serving God and getting killed on the spot. And then more was added. For Moses jumped in immediately and said to Aaron and the other two brothers of those who had died, now don't you shed a tear, don't mess up your hair, which was one of the ways of showing that they were in mourning. Don't do anything like that. God will get angry with you too. Just act normal and keep your mouth shut. Well, they couldn't touch their bodies and, because then they would get corrupted. So they got a pair of their cousins and called them in and said, hold them out. They didn't want to touch them either. Pulled them out by their coats without touching their flesh. Charred bodies and got rid of them. All at the beginning of the priesthood. I say this, God help us with the deepest significance and meaning. God help us. What did they do? What did they do? Look for a moment, not at your notes, just look at this here. Imagine again, looking sideways at it, that this is the tabernacle. You've heard this 10,000 times, but here it is again, the thing we're trying to build over here. We are building bit by bit. Here it is. Here's the tabernacle. Let's say this is the way in. This is the perimeter. There's no roof over this, seven and a half foot high. You come in here. Here's the brazen altar. That's where the animals were slain. That speaks of Calvary. Then you go past the laver. Then up here, remember, there is another smaller tent. It's twice the height, and it does have a roof, four-ply roof. And inside, it's, di it's divided into two rooms. Remember, the holy place and the holiest of all. Well, in that holy place, there were three items of furniture. One right against the curtain between it and the holiest of all called the altar of incense, the place where there was to be a beautiful perfume that would fill the whole place and it would go up as praise and worship unto God. God said this. He said, when you were sending this perfume up, by the way, there was also the table of showbread in there, speaking of our tithes and offerings unto God, and there was the golden candlestick, speaking of us as Christians being led by the Holy Spirit. Christ is the candlestick, the Holy Spirit, the oil. So it's a typification of us in Christ. It's beautiful. But what they did in order to get this perfume and these spices up here within this enclosed tent, they were to go to the brazen altar, Calvary, and they were to take a censer, like a flat pan. I don't think you can exactly say a frying pan, but almost like that. And they were to get coals from off this altar. Speaking of Calvary, they were to bring them in here to the altar of incense. They were to put them down there, and then they were to have special incense, which was to be made. God give the details four different kinds. We'll come to it in a moment. Of spices to give the most magnificent aroma. Speaking of the Christian life as we're worshiping and serving God, as the priests were doing their work, this aroma just filled the whole place, this perfume. Well, they were to bring it in. The fire was to come in from there. They had it in their censer. Then on top of the altar, then they put on this beautiful four parts of spices. And as the smoke went up, the perfume filled the house, filled the room. It was beautiful. That's the way it was supposed to be. Nadab and Abihu, the oldest of the two sons, a pair of punks. Who do they think they are? Who did they think they were? Big-headed, arrogant, stupid, idiots, 
who decided they could do it their way. First of all, they did not need to get the fire from the brazen altar. They could kindle their own fire. So God says they used strange fire. You know, when you go in here, to use this as an illustration, and this speaks of Calvary, the brazen altar, do you know where that fire came from when they were uh, sacrificing the animals and they put them in, the grill was halfway down, animals were being sacrificed? you know where that fire came from? It wasn't started by Moses. It was not started by anybody. The Bible says the fire fell from heaven. It was all of God. God did it. Why? Because Calvary is all of God. Then God said, you will keep it burning and it will never be allowed to go out. In other words, you will keep the message of Calvary alive, the message of the shedding of blood alive. They didn't do that. They kindled their own fire. It was worse than that. When they got it in and there was the fire, they're not yet dead, but they've only got seconds to go, maybe. The law of the first mention. God sent not a warning. Today, in New Testament grace times, it seems like God is more patient. But one of these days, He's going to deal with people who not only commit that sin, but who commit the next one. You know what the next sin was? Instead of reading, and I'm going to read it to you in a moment, instead of reading again the details of the mixture of the four blends of the spices to get it exactly right, to make it a beautiful perfume of praise and worship to God, they made their own concoction. So not only did they have strange fire, they have strange incense. And here they set it off to God. It gets worse. You won't believe this bit. And the reason why I call them two punks, they were drunk while they were doing it. First day of ordination. First day of operation of the ordination. Dealing with God Almighty for what was happening then, but also, of course, as a type and shadow for us. You mustn't mess up the type and shadow. They kindle their own fire. They concoct their own incense. And they're drunk on the job. There's other things, too. Let's leave it at that for a moment. God didn't take very long until fire came out from the holiest of all, and hit the two of them to the point where it was instant death. No dealings, no discussion, no negotiation. What? They're dead. They lay there, and I've already explained, nobody could touch them lest they got contaminated. One of the rules of the priests. They get their cousins and they haul them out. Can you believe anybody would have strange fire? Strange incense, one speaks of Calvary, the other is our praise and worship, and be drunk on the job, especially when they're just starting, full of themselves, full of arrogance, full of big-headed, I, me, mine, and my picture on the wall. Heads are so big they'll hardly get out the door. They decided to commit the worst sin in the world to do it their way. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The worst sin that you can commit is probably not even murder. It's trying to run your life your own way. Like your child, when it's born, starts to grow up, it wants to do it its own way, and you have to discipline it to make sure that they do it your way, do it the right way. Likewise, we're supposed to do it God's way, and when we behave like punks and try to do it our own way, like I've referred to before, Frank Sinatra and that amazing song, More, Much More Than This, I Did It My Way. The most tragic testimony you've ever heard. And I'm not saying him personally, I'm talking about the song. To do it our way. Don't be stupid. God's way is the best way. Do it God's way. And above all, don't make these three mistakes. Don't get your own kindling when we're talking about Calvary. Don't get your own concoction when we're talking about praise and worship. And don't have a cavalier attitude toward the ministry if you're within the preached ministry or if you're within the body of Christ. Realize the seriousness that while there's a lot of joy, this is a very serious thing and the Bible says it is a fearsome thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What is happening? 
Well, it's happening today. It's happening all over the world. You've got abundant proof of it on Christian television. God got Calvary going. The fire fell. He said to them, you keep it going. I got it going. You keep it going. And he warned them, that fire must never go out. That fire must never go out. Remember as a little boy during the World War, they used to sing, keep the home fires burning. Keep the fire burning. It must never go out. With tears, I tell you. I tell you on television, with tears. The fire of the cross and of the blood has almost gone out, even on Christian television. I've been in Wales many times. You know the country of Wales, but not of recent years. But they tell the story there, apparently a true story of a small town. Uh, the center of the town, in fact, there was different cities that had this, was called the Cross. And this particular late Saturday night on a bus away outside the town, the bus was going in, and a drunk got onto the bus. And he said to the conductor in his silly, drunken way, give me a six-penny ticket to hell, he said. And the conductor said, I'm sorry, sir, we're only going as far as the cross. I want you to know that the church has gone beyond the cross and they're now kindling their own kindling in order to do it their way and to attract people in their emotions instead of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's an utter absolute tragedy. I can give you a few instances without going into it in detail because we don't have the time. The cross, by and large, though it would be denied by the perpetrators, but by and large, the cross has been replaced with positive thinking. Have you heard those preachers on TV smile? And boy, they'll get a crowd, let me tell you. Everything's all right. Tell nice little stories about how you can be positive and how everything will work out properly. It's their own kindling, or it's positive thinking, or it's money. Money, money, money. Give me the money. Everything's money. And nowadays, it's not that you come to the cross and God blesses you because of the efficacy of the cross. It's because of the dollar that you can send your favorite TV preacher. It's awful. And all you who watch me across this country and other countries, let me tell you, God's getting ready for judgment within His own house. The church almost talks too much about judgment on the world for drunkenness or abortion or whatever, homosexuality, those things are wrong. We know that. However, what we're supposed to talk about to the world is the grace of God. But within the church, it's supposed to be the judgment of God to get us back to what? To what He started and what He told us to continue, which is to preach what? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight. Now I'm happy all the day. He did not say at the place of seed faith. He did not say it's where you give your dollars. He did not say it's positive thinking. He did not say it's the felt needs. And the biggest one of all is self-esteem. Can you see it being said? Self-esteem. God deliver us. They're using their own kindling. Did you get the point? I could take a few hours to enlarge on that. You're a smart audience. You've got the point, haven't you? Their own kindling. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. Some of my friends that I have known and preached for for years and who have been in Ireland and preached it, you guys are on television. You're preaching a wrong message and you know it. And you're fooled because you're so much demanding other things that you seem to be getting bigger and bigger crowds and you've misread that for the blessing of God. You're kindling your own kindling and God doesn't like it. God wants us to return to the message of C.H. Spurgeon. And that message is, we meet him at the place of the mercy seat, which is where the blood was shed and nowhere else. Amen. Blessed be God. Go ahead and praise him. Let's read there what it says in Leviticus 10, 1 through 11, if we can get over it all. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, do you see where I'm reading, and put fire therein and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, 
This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Shut up. And Moses called Michelle and Elisphan, I think it is, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats. Wouldn't even touch them out of the camp. Look, look this way. I'm telling you, that reduces your pride in a hurry, doesn't it? From arrogantly strutting about because they thought they looked great. Now they're dead and people won't even touch them except hauling them out by their coats. As Moses had said, and Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and Ithamar, the two sons that was left, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes. Don't tassel your hair and don't tear your clothes because you're sorry. You shouldn't be sorry for the demise of these idiots. Lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, let them bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, for the anointing all of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink. Get rid of the alcohol. Preachers don't need to get drunk in order to minister, do they? This is awful. Thou nor thy sons with thee when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation. How dare they? It was an insult. Don't you see that part? It was an insult to God. Lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean, or separate the precious from the vile. As Jeremiah says, And that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord had spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Look this way. First thing, they destroyed the pure message of the shedding of the blood by producing their own kindling. You cannot destroy the types and the shadows. I've told you before why Moses was locked out of the promised land after all the good he did. Here is the rock which typified Christ. Christ wouldn't come for 1,500 years, but it typified Christ. And so Moses was supposed to hit the rock and get water right, and he did that, and it was wonderful. Later on, he was told, speak to the rock. Don't hit it again, just speak to it. But he got mad with the people, and he hit it again. Destroy the type and shadow, making it look like that when Jesus died, when the rock died, then Calvary wasn't sufficient, and you had to hit him again. No! The secret is he died once on Calvary from now on to get life-giving water. You only have to ask him. He doesn't have to die again because he died once and for all. That's where the mass is so wrong and so blasphemous within the Roman Catholic Church. So Moses knew what it was to mess it up in that area. But these fellows messed up the type and shadow of Calvary and it is being done all the time. It is being put further and further back. But there's something also real bad. Now listen to this bit. When they brought the fire with their own kindling, oh, you'd love to spend more time on it. Brought it in on the frying pan, I'm calling it the censer, and brought it in here. Then they were to get the four spices. I'm going to give you details in a moment. Get the four spices. God was the one who said how to do it. And he said, you will put it there, and then it will give this beautiful aroma. Speaks of Christ, us worshiping Christ, and the blessing of Christ upon us. But then the Christian work, along with the table of showbread, as you know, and the golden candlestick, they did that wrong too. They had the wrong concoction. Did it their way. So what was messed up? Calvary and praise and worship. What is messed up most in the church today? I'm talking about the so-called evangelical church. I'll tell you what's messed up the most. The pure message of the cross and praise and worship. Do you know what Christians have done, what we call praise and worship? you know what we have done? Now think of this insult. We're drunk, maybe not with wine, but we're drunk with a sense of our own importance and stupidity. You know what we do? We say, well, you know, here's a group over here, they're singing for Jesus. Oh, really? Yeah. And here's a group over here, they're singing for Jesus. And here's a group over here, they're singing for Jesus. So we'll have a race. We'll have a competition. And then what we'll do at the end of the year, we'll bring them all into one big hall and we'll vote on it and see who sings the best for Jesus. 
And it's all based on the bottom line dollar, who sells the most CDs, nothing else. And then we so-called award them, we make superstars out of them, we almost worship them. And let me give you a little warning. The people who are most susceptible, obviously, to messing up the ministry are the preachers, that's there at the brazen altar, and those involved in praise and worship, that is, singers and musicians. Sometimes I turn on television and you watch something that's supposed to be praise and worship. It almost makes you sick. It's like jungle music. And sometimes, did you not notice preachers can't preach anymore? Many times without music in the background, they'll say something. It's supposed to be a great revelation. There's no revelation on it. But they'll say, you know, you are a woman of destiny. That's the, that's the big one today. We're all women of destiny or men of destiny. And as soon as they say that, then here's the organist. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> and you are a great person. Turn right and say to the person next to you, you're looking at greatness. They said that the other day. You're looking at greatness. And as soon as you do that, bum, 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 here he goes again. All to what? All to concoct something that will appeal to the emotions and the entertainment side of human beings. And we have thrown out the proper, beautiful spices of pure worship to God. The platform is not to be a place of showy-offness. Yes, if you long for the platform all the time, you better hit the altar and say, God, what's the matter with me that I just can't wait to get up there? I don't want to discourage anybody from, anybody from praising the Lord and using your talents for the Lord. That's one thing. But you know what I'm talking about. There's people who just get so full of their own importance. Well, let me tell you something, friends. You're not that important after all. And what God wants is this. He wants the preachers to preach the pure message of Calvary and not the mixture between seed faith and, and positive thinking and self-esteem and felt needs and all that stuff. And he wants praise and worship people to get up there to use an old phrase and to get hid far behind the cross and be an instrument to lead people in pure praise and worship and not in a demonstration of fleshly showy-offness. I had to say all that. Go ahead and praise them if you would. It is right to use our talents. I'm not discouraging anybody. But I don't tell me that I'm the only one that's turned on television and got so turned off by so-called praise and worship. Do you not notice that at the beginning of the ministry here and the priesthood, that's the two things they did wrong? What was the third thing? The third thing, they were drunk. Yeah, they were drunk with alcohol. But as an indication today, we are drunk. We don't have the right judgment anymore. Why? Because we can run church and it's a million miles from what the Lord wants, and we don't seem to know it. I verily believe that when the rapture happens and we go, a lot of people will still have church next Sunday morning. The Lord was in it anyway, and they won't miss him when he's gone. <laughs> now, you may think that somebody annoyed me this morning. No. I told you I started off feeling good. Remember I told you that? I was feeling good. I still feel good. Because I know I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. One man said to me several years ago, you're out of your mind. We were only, we were only visiting America then. We didn't live in America. What, 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 what do you mean? He said, you're from Ireland. You're from Belfast. He said, Belfast's burning. They're, they're shooting. They're killing. They're bombing. He said, forget the preaching. Forget the preaching. He said, get a camera and photograph all that and put it on TV. He said, the Americans will give you millions. Move on their emotions and be their souls. Who cares? Give them what they want rather than what they need. Well, we haven't done it. We have tried to preach to you a pure message. And when it comes to needs, we're relying on God to meet and supply all our needs. I want a ministry that's pure, a pure ministry, not a punk ministry. These pair of boys have probably never been called punks before. It's 3,500 years in the waiting. It's near time. Amen. Look at the bottom there. Please note the following five very important points. Strange fire. That's Leviticus 10.1. Leviticus 8.23.30. And he slew it, and Moses took of the blood of it. This is a further scripture. And put it upon the tip of Aaron's right ear, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And Moses took the anointing oil 
and of the blood which is upon the altar and sprinkled upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon his sons' garments with them and sanctified Aaron. Don't turn over yet. Hold it just for a second. Look at me. Well, I tell you this, friends. Listen to it. Do you know what? This is probably an exaggeration, but it's almost not. Do you know what the tabernacle was almost swimming in? Blood and oil. It was everywhere. Oil on Aaron, on, on, on his sons. Even this incense altar that I told you about, it had four horns. You've heard of the horns of the altar, splattered with blood. Everything splattered with blood. Out there at the brazen altar was blood, blood, blood everywhere, and oil everywhere. And then here's Aaron. He's going to be priest. You know what Moses does? Because God told him to do it. You're going to be a priest. You're going to minister. Here's what's going to happen to you. He went over and got the blood out of the sacrifice when the animal was slain. And Moses got some of that blood, and he put it on his right earlobe, covered it in blood. Seems very gory, but that's what it says. I just read it to you. And there's more scriptures to prove it too. Once he got that done, he said, put out your thumb of your right hand. So he put that out, covered it in blood too. Now give me the toe, your big toe of your right foot, and he covered it in blood too. Blood, blood, blood. To signify what? From now on you must understand your ear is to hear from God, not from the flesh. Your hand is to work for God, not for yourself. And your feet, they are to walk with God and not in the ways of this world. You're dedicated to God. Why? Even when a leper came to be cleansed, you know they did the same thing. They put it here, they put it here, they put it here to say, have an ear for your master's voice. Work for God and walk with God. But wait till you hear the next bit. They, oh, they then took the oil, the anointing oil. And when they got the oil, they went back over all three. And now they put the oil on top of the blood on the right ear lobe. The blood's already there. And they put oil on top of it. And oil goes on top of the thumb. And oil goes on top of the big toe. So now we have oil being attracted to the blood, and it is what it is ministered on top of the blood. It was at the start of the tabernacle. It's the picture of salvation. What is it? Let me tell you what it is. The anointing is attracted to the blood. The anointing oil is attracted to the blood. That is, when we're glorifying Calvary, glorifying the blood, that is a pure message. We will get the anointing. But listen. If you don't do it that way, and you kindle your own things, then you have to concoct the anointing. Because the oil is not attracted to the blood. The oil is not attracted to false kindling. So you concoct the anointing. And what is that? Well, you might have to sing a chorus 53 times until you alter people's behavior. <laughs> the cartwheels come in. I'm all for people clapping their hands and praising God. You know what I'm talking about. There's people on the platform who are expert, experts at this. We alter their behavior. You make them feel good. Now you can go to a movie and feel good. You can go to a ball game and feel good. People, now listen to it, have something different than the mixture of the oil and the blood. They've got the mixture of psychology and the adrenaline. Psychology producing the adrenaline, and that attracts more people who want more of the psychology and the adrenaline, and it ends up there's a multitude there, and they think they're having church, and they learn nothing. Sometimes I'll listen for a while and say, I never learned a thing from anything he said, nothing. What did he say? I don't know what he said. He said nothing. The oil will always come upon that where the blood was applied when we honor Calvary, God will anoint what we have got to say and it will make a difference in people's lives. Go ahead and praise Him. If we don't say too much from the platform. Let me tell you, we get words all the time from you and from others who come. God is moving here. People's lives are being changed. I used to make a lot of altar calls when we used to travel a lot. People to come out to be saved. I'm not against it. We'll probably do it again from time to time. But these days, as I get older and depend more and more on God and His Word, I preach and leave it with God, and then I get reports that God is changing people's lives. God is bringing people through. Why? Well, we're not entertaining anybody, but we've discovered this, that the oil is attracted to the blood. Is that not beautiful, friends? Turn over to the second page there, if you would. In 
go to number two. Strange incense. But I'm going to read to you, so look back this way. I'm going to read to you a few verses which are not in your notes. So listen to them. And the Lord said unto Moses, this is Exodus 30, verse 34. The Lord said unto Moses, take unto these sweet spices. The first one really means gum resin. And onica and galbanum. These sweet spices and pure frankincense. Now listen, everybody. Just keep watching me. Of each there shall be a like weight. There's four. What are these four different spices for? Listen to me. The death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ. Preach it all. It gives a beautiful perfume. He said, I want you to get it exactly right. And he said, uh, Thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together. It will be pure, it will be holy, and thou shalt beat some of it very small and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with you, and it shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to this composition thereof, it shall be holy unto the Lord. Look this way. Don't try to share this composition with anybody else. This is for me. Give me your heart. Give it to nobody else. For whosoever, ready for this? For whosoever shall make like unto that, or whosoever shall use that wrongly, and smell it thereof and enjoy it, when it's not me that's getting the glory, they're going to be cut off from among the people. Wow! That's Exodus 30, verse 38. I told you the first part of this message would be scary. See, I have no time for all these notes here. Intoxicated. No mourning. Bodies removed. I already talked about those things in brief. Look at me. Let, let's let that settle in, and then we're going to change gears. It's half time. We're going to change gears and think about what could be called the more positive side, particularly the high priest garments, just in three areas. One, the stones on his shoulders. Two, the stones on his breastplate. And three, those two little things that were inside the breastplate because it was a pouch. And there were two strange little things there called the Urim and the Thummim, and I'll leave that for a minute. There's something I was going to say. I'll leave it for a minute. Those are the three things we're going to look at here, here, and inside here. That's all. So look back one more time at the uh, back page, and then we'll come back again. Am I going too fast, or are you following me all right? Give me a little wave. I need a wave. The high priest garments. Let's look at it again. Remember, you at home, you can get these notes, 570 including this beautiful uh, colored uh, uh, picture here of the high priest. You see the mitre up there, and you see the breastplate. Can you see that, everybody there? And you see those four rows, each with three stones. Can you see that, the audience here in Tarpon Springs? You can see that, can't you? Well, that also was a pouch where he could put his hands in there. And it all speaks of Christ. And then, of course, there was the sash, the girdle there, the ephod itself, then there's the blue robe, and then underneath the breeches. And that was, look back this way, that was literally, if you want to know, it's the underpants. God has no pleasure in the legs of a man. That's what the Bible says. Cover up. When they were making the brazen altar, they had to build it in such a way, it's pretty ugly to talk about, it was built in a kind of a ramp not just on regular steps so that there would be no accidents and somebody see up his clothes. It's pretty gross to talk about. God didn't want any display of the flesh when you're dealing with Calvary. That's just another proof of it. That's what the breeches were. That's his underpants. Not what we're talking about, but that's what the meaning is. In case you go home and say, I've never heard of the breeches, but I've heard of the breeches. Is it something similar? I was asked that this morning. The answer is yes. But look at his shoulders. You can't see it very good on this particular diagram. But look, look back at me then. On one shoulder was a big onyx stone. 
and it was set in a couch, look, look this way, a couch or an ouch it's called, of gold. Here it is sitting in gold, and there's a big onyx stone there, and it's here, and it's tied in to this marvelous breastplate, the breastplate of the, uh, the ephod. There's one on the other side as well. And then here there are 12 stones. So we have 12, 13, 14. What are they for? It all speaks of Christ in color and in stones. What were they? We'll keep it simple. This is the second part and the last part of the message. So let's keep it simple. And let's go back to... Uh, well, let me see where to go to. Go to, there's just so many things here. All right, go back to that number two there, page two, where it says the high priest garments. After the giving of the law and after the giving of the details of the tabernacle, the office of the priest was introduced and restricted to one family, that of Aaron. Exodus 28, 1, And take they, thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the high priest's office, even Aaron, Nabdab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. The dress of the high priest consisted of seven articles, all speaking of Christ. The breeches, the coat, the girdle, the blue robe, the ephod, the breastplate of judgment, and the mitre. All these are found in Exodus 28. The details of the actual making of these garments are found in Exodus chapter 39. These beautiful garments all speak of Jesus. The garments were for glory and beauty. Exodus 28, 2. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. See also Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3, and John 17, verse 24. The garments were to be made out of the very best material, including gold, blue, purple, scarlet, and fine linen. Then you can come over here. Look this way. Now this all speaks of Christ. He is our high priest. He's your high priest. Look this way, everybody. To put it in its simplest terms, every day he's bearing you up on his shoulders. Every day he's got you close to his heart. And every day he's guiding you, which is meant by the Urim and the Thummim. It's all typified in Christ and in these ouches of gold because over here there, on the right shoulder engraved were the six names of the eldest boys of the sons of Jacob, the tribes. And on the left shoulder were the six younger ones. But they were all by the high priest every time he would enter the holy place, all born up. I see him out of time. I want to finish this in a second. God bless you. We've got four pages here, including a beautiful diagram of the high priest. Asked for 570. The notes are free. It's called Strange Fire, but there's more than that about this message. Same time next week in the same channel. Be tuning in. I'll see you then. We'll be looking at you. And in the meantime, God bless you and pray for me. He would go in to minister before the Lord. Our high priest ever liveth to make intercession. Jesus doesn't do it every Sunday at 10 just for you. Or just when you hit a crisis. He ever. Because you're perfect? Ha, 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 ha. Far from it. Because you're trusting in what the brazen altar speaks of, what he sent fire to get started, the glories of Calvary and D.K. Usine imparted righteousness. God gives you his righteousness. And every day when things are tough and rough and it seems like people have been wrong and things are going wrong and circumstances have been blown up in your face every day, all the time, it's, it's almost inconceivable to us, but it's true. Jesus has a ministry of intercession and he's bearing you up on his shoulders because every one of their names, and you read about these 12 fellows, and they were far from perfect. But their names were on his shoulders, and where were the names? Listen to me. 
not only on beautiful stones, but they were set in gold. Gold in the Bible always speaks of God. We are in Christ. We are in God. We're in Him because of His righteousness, not ours. And He has our names, that is, our problems, our difficulties, our everything on His broad shoulders. And He's bearing you up before the Lord 24 hours a day. Will you praise Him, please? 24 hours a day. Lord, he's got this financial problem. Lord, she's got this difficulty. Lord, there is this sickness. I've provided for to help them to believe. I'm burdened for them. Lord, I died to get them all these blessings, and, and I want them to get these blessings, but I want to bear the burden. This is our high priest. You know what Jesus said? I won't keep you too much longer, but listen to it. Jesus said he's like the shepherd. There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. One was out from the hills far away, far off from the gates of gold. And he went. Jesus told the story. And the poor little sheep was in a mess and he is lost and he is miserable. And he grabbed it. Do you know what Jesus himself said? Jesus said, speaking of himself, but referring to the shepherd as the analogy, he said he takes the sheep and he lays it on his shoulder. It says in Isaiah that the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now you're living life. There's a government in your life. That is, there's decisions to be made, judgments to be made, but it's not on your shoulders. They're too puny in your work, in your job. But because you've trusted Christ, not because of your goodness, because you've trusted him, he's bearing you on his shoulders every day. He is not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, was in all points tempted like as we are, because he is holy and harmless and undefiled. And every day he bears you up. Here's the strange thing, almost the laughable thing, though it's not funny. Who came home rejoicing? In the story about the shepherd, did Jesus say, and on their way home, the sheep was so happy, and the sheep called the other sheep and said, Come and rejoice with me. The sheep didn't have a proper appreciation of his lostness. Who did the rejoicing? Who was tickled? Who was thrilled to find the lost sheep and put it on his shoulders and go home and say, Let's have a party. It was the shepherd. Who is the thrilled one? More than us when we get found and when we walk with God and when we commit our burdens unto him. We don't appreciate enough of what, how awful hell is, how glorious heaven is, uh, uh, the extent of our lostness, but He does. And therefore, when we come to Him and give our whole lives to Him and start to trust Him, His shoulders bear us up, and He couldn't be happier. He's almost delirious with happiness. He calls a party with the angels and says, Rejoice with me over one sheep that was left, and behold, He has been found. He brought it home, not under his arm. The analogy is significant, on his shoulders. Today, tomorrow, next week, next month, and all your problems and troubles, you may think, well, it's no big deal. What are you talking about? He is the God of the detail. Everything you're going through, it's on his shoulders. All their names were here. Well, I don't deserve to be there, neither did they, but they were arched on those beautiful onyx stones and they were set in gold. And when you're in Christ, you're on His shoulders, in His round-the-clock, round-the-clock intercession meeting for you. And it's going on right now. For even though there's millions of believers, He can handle it. And He's calling your name right now and bearing those burdens that you thought were too big for you. Do you think that's nice, friends? That's a perfect picture of who He is. And then he told them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Beautiful stones, all shining in the light there, resplendent, but also in arches of gold. But all 12 of them with their own stone this time, showing the diversity of our needs and then individuality of the way he works with us. It's on the basis of our trust and his supply. Here we're so different, so different from somebody else. But where are we now? Well, we know we're on his shoulders. He's bearing us up. But we're also on his heart, for he loves us. If he loved you when you're at your worst, 
If Christ died for us when we were yet in our sins, yet ungodly, how much more so now when we're trying to live for him? You're on his heart every day. And then inside the pouch was the Urim and the Thummim. And I kept it till now. This one speaks of strength to bear us up. This one talks of love for on his heart. And this inner one, the Urim and Thummim, speaks of guidance. In the Hebrew, Urim and Thummim, it means lights and perfection or lights and full truth. I will give you light, and I will give you truth. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. If you want God's will, I close with this, it's almost impossible for you not to get God's will. It's not a hard thing to find. You say, what am I supposed to do? Do what you know to do, but what if it's not right? Jesus said, if it were not so, I would have told you. If there's something not right, he is ways to let you know. But just you start to praise him that you're in his will, and with the Urim and the Thummim, he will guide you. It speaks of the Holy Spirit's guidance. We don't really know how they used it. Some people think it was almost like a lot when they didn't know what to do. If they'd throw them down and one turned a certain way, like dice almost, that would mean a yes and the other one would mean a no. We don't know that. We do know that it speaks of guidance right by his heart. So he's got these three big things for you as your high priest, as your great high priest. He's bearing your burdens. What do you mean, my burdens? Yeah, the pain in your side, the mortgage that you can't pay, the fallout with your loved one, whatever it is. He's burning on his shoulders. He has you at his heart, and he's determined to guide you in a perfect way into all truth. Why? Because he is our great high priest, and he's filled with glory and with beauty. And what does he ask us to do? To make sure we don't come up with our own kindling, he was the one that introduced Calvary. Let's keep Calvary alive and the message of the cross. He was the one that told us the mixture for the perfume of our worship. Let's do it His way and praise Him with all of our hearts. And let's never get intoxicated with our own importance. But to repent and say, God, you do it your way. And as I surrender to your way, then I know, Lord, I will be blessed for every day. You're bearing me up, I'm in your heart, and you're guiding me through the Urim and Thummim. And by the way, their names were also on all 12 stones. That's it. Stand, will you please? There's too much to say, but anyway, that's it. If you got this from the Lord, put your hands together and praise Him. I can't hear it. Can't hear it.